we can make it on uh, on our website later on. But thank you all for joining us for um, this, as I said, our first nature program series evening program of February. Um, I want to first start by thanking Tin Mountains Nature Program Series sponsors, and they are Ragged Mountain Equipment, Hancock Lumber, and White Mountain Oil and Propane. So we do thank them for their financial support that allow us to continue presenting programs such as this. I also want to thank a moment, take a moment to thank all of you watching who are current members of Tin Mountain, because additionally, your membership dollars help uh, help us fulfill our mission um, and put these programs on as well. If you are not currently a member of Tin Mountain, I would encourage you to consider doing so. And you can find information on membership right on our website in the right hand corner. There is a tab that says support us. Um, on that same tab, if membership's not right at this point, there is also um, a way just to donate directly to our nature program series. Uh, to help us continue putting these on. Um, before I hand things over to Rick for this evening, um, I did also want to put a plug in for a few of our upcoming programs. Um, as I mentioned, so in addition to this evening's program, um, for those interested in putting your new, new skills or brushed up skills um, to the test this Saturday the 5th, uh, we have a field component from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, we still have a few spots left in that program, and you can find registration, e registration information uh, and a link to do so right on our website, tinmountain.org. Uh, coming up, we actually have a number of field programs coming up next Saturday. On the 12th, we have a um, a winter tree ID field program um, that is filling up fast. Uh, and that will be led by Dave Gavatsky. And then the following Friday, the 18th, uh, we have our annual, um, we have our annual uh, winter birding trip down to Plum Island. So coastal birding down at Plum Island in Massachusetts. Um, so lots of great field programs coming up if you are looking to get out and explore. Um, and, and again, all, there's information for all of those programs on our website, tinmountain.org. Otherwise, um, before just a few quick housekeeping things before I hand um, reins over to Rick, if, um, if you've not been on a Tin Mountain I mean, on one of our Zoom programs before, um, it looks, I think everyone was muted when when you entered, but just making sure you keep that mute on so that we don't pick up any unintentional sound um, in from your background. If you have a question during the program, I would encourage you to type it right into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. There's a little speech bubble. And if you click on that, you can type your questions directly in there. I will be monitoring that chat. Um, and if it's, in a, if it's a clarifying question, I'm happy to uh, jump in and ask it immediately of Rick. Otherwise, um, we'll hold off until the end of the program and I will ask those questions of him at that time. Um, at which point you're also welcome to, um, after that, unmute yourself and ask any questions of him. <clears throat> Woo! And that's my, that is my introductory so song and dance. And with that, um, I am very pleased to hand things over to uh, Dr. Rick Vanderpool, who, for those of you who don't know, is also uh, currently Tin Mountain's research director um, for this program on winter tracking. Okay, well, thanks, Nora. Appreciate it. And thanks, Lori, for the whole host here. Uh, this is uh, just a fantastic opportunity to, you know, dive deep into the unknown. And I say that, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, but to be honest, this is something that I always enjoy doing because we get to talk about the critters that we largely do not see. I mean, unless it's a coyote on your way home or, you know, the mountain lion that crossed in front of your car and that kind of thing. Um, 
it's usually uh, a, by tracks and sign only that we get a chance to know a little bit who our other fur bear cousins are in the woods. Yeah, okay, maybe I don't have so much fur, but we are mammals nonetheless. And we share a lot of that in terms of our bodily actions, our behaviors, our movements. And maybe as we step back a little bit into the sort of um, mechanics and the physiology of some of these critters, um, you can relate, you know, like when winter comes, you want to just go to sleep or um, when it's hot out, you realize that that you have to, you know, cool your feet off because otherwise you overheat. So there are all kinds of things that us uh, endotherms, our endothermic um, mammals as we are, uh, things that we share with these two leggeds and four leggeds that I'm going to talk about. And um, I know some of you, I recognize some of your names, and I know some of you who have been on these uh, talks, walks before, so uh, bear with me, but um, we'll, we'll get through as much as we can tonight, and I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen. So give it a minute. There we go. It would be helpful if I hit the share button. There we go. All right. Now we can start the slideshow and a thumbs up from Nora. Good. All right. So uh, again, this is a, a talk that I have been giving uh, since 1985. Um, I had had the opportunity to um, learn from some really great people, uh, people who are far more knowledgeable than I that spend all of their time uh, working with mammals. Uh, I'll mention a couple of them, but Joe Merritt comes to mind. Joe is the current um, editor of um, uh, Wildlife Monographs, and he has uh, done a, a tremendous job. He's now retired from Powder Mill Nature Reserve in Pennsylvania, wrote the Mammals of Pennsylvania book, used to teach at Antioch where I used to teach. And I've learned so much from a lot of these uh, wildlife biologists around the country really. Uh, and some of them I'll, I'll talk more about as, as we go forward. Uh, but getting into the, the basics of the field, again, we're all mammals here. So um, as far as I know, I don't know if any of, uh, if you've got any birds in the background, but uh, being that as it, that as it may, uh, it's uh, of course defined by the presence of mammary glands. That's uh, one of the, the ways in which we define the class of mammals. Uh, we are all uh, fur-bearing in that sense, as I said, bearing live young or viviparous, and arose from the Miocene roughly 65 million years ago. And uh, therein lies the Larson comic on the left. You know, um, they're all laughing at this little porcupine. Well, <laughs> as the snow begins to fall, it, it, it's a little bit of a, a asynchronistic comic, but you get the point. Um, mammals have survived uh, some of the climatic changes that we've uh, seen on the planet and hopefully will continue to do so. Most mammals are quadrupedal, uh, but of course we have a couple of bipedals like ourselves. And uh, as a consequence, you really have to look at some of the finer details like the dentition, you know, which opens a whole new world of understanding how an animal relates to its environment, right? If you think about the dentition, whether it's a crocodile or a gecko <laughs> or snake, and, and, you know, and, but in the mammal group, think about the difference in teeth between say a cat and a dog. You can begin to appreciate how those teeth have evolved over the millions of years to adapt to consuming foods that will allow them to survive and optimize habitat where they live. Of course, there's a lot of reasons to uh, track mammals or look at their sign, uh, not the least of which, as I opened with, is to understand more about who's in our neighborhood. Um, some of you might have critters uh, that may occasionally attract a, a, a vagrant predator or two. 
Uh, but for the most part, unless you've, you're baiting them or have some type of attractant at your house, they go unnoticed. And since most of them are nocturnal, even in the wintertime, uh, it's very clear that, that we know less about our, our mammal friends that are, that are nocturnal than certainly some of our bird friends that uh, tend to be very visible during the day. Understanding their adaptations helps us understand how the mechanics of an ecosystem works. And it's typical, as many of you know, to use, say, a keystone animal, which almost, <laughs> almost always is a mammal. If you look at the definition of a keystone animal, uh, so many uh, mammals are used as an example of them, like uh, a grizzly bear in the uh, up northern Rocky Mountains. Uh, or beaver for us in the Northeast. These are keystone animals that have a distinct shaping effect on their environment and as a consequence, have a ripple effect on so many other species. Discerning the habitats, of course, is uh, another key to understanding where these uh, species live and what they do in them and understanding how they move from habitat to other habitats. Um, or within a given region is another purpose that has gotten a great deal of press. I think the term wildlife corridor, um, I used that in, uh, what was it, 1977, when I was talking to uh, some people in Richmond, New Hampshire, where I was living at the time, about not logging a particular riparian area. And I said, well, where are the otter going to go? You know, if you log everything, they're going to, it's going to be a little bit challenging. So I, you know, it's a term that's now in vogue and we learn, have learned a lot, uh, whether it's building bridges over the Banff Highway for elk or whether it's building an underpass for spotted salamanders in Amherst, Massachusetts. There's all kinds of different types of uh, values now placed on wildlife corridors. So in doing that research, we become better at being what a lot of people call cultural trackers, you know, the cultural tracking craze. You can actually get an online certification um, as a cyber tracker, which is, uh, of course, a, a, an organization that teaches about tracking online. You can follow up this program and type that into your search engine and uh, start taking classes and earn your sort of cyber tracking certificate, as it were. So there are lots of lots and lots of reasons for doing it. As I said, many great mammalogists have come before me uh, and have written a number of guides for us to get better at uh, our tracking efforts. Um, I have, of course, my list of small favorites, but I started, like many of you, perhaps uh, using the Olas uh, Murray's Animal Track. Uh, Peterson Field Guide, which is down there in the sort of lower left. And that was my very first book. My, actually, my grandfather had it uh, when it first came out in the 60s. And um, I sort of cut my teeth on understanding the tracks behind our farm in New Hampton when I was uh, um, a younger, younger, much younger person. But since that time, we've had some great books added to our repertoire for literature. And you can take a screenshot of that. But as Laura said, we're going to have a, a recording of this so you can look back and, and get a closer look at, at, at some of the titles. I particularly like the Mammal Track and Sign book in the upper left. That's fairly recent. Um, it's uh, by Mark Elbrock. Uh, uh, Mark is one of the cyber tracker teachers, uh, helped start that organization and um, has just done a tremendous job throughout North America, including New Hampshire. He did some research for fish and game relative to lynxes in Northern New Hampshire. So there's some great people out there who have done great work and have left us with a, a good legacy of literature to, to follow up with. Um, so getting down to the basic terms, I know this will be a repeat for many of you, but it's useful as we go forward to have some of these terms um, understood. Tracks is the most common mammal sign that we will use to interpret where mammals are in the landscape. And of course, you have different aspects of the tracks. We'll talk some more about the details of for different species. But in general, you're looking at front feet or hind feet on a quadruped. And as it's you know, very common to 
uh, when I started tracking, I thought always thought the hind foot was the big foot, and it's not. The front foot is really the bigger of the two sets of feet on most of our quadrupeds because it has to have the strength and power to direct the animal in a, in a, in a way that will help them in all of their sort of meeting their needs, their reproductive needs, their predation needs, their feeding needs, whatever it is, or uh, escape needs, as it were. So uh, that's, uh, that's common. Uh, you've got toe pads that you're looking at. Uh, we'll review those in a second, which include, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the terminal pads and then the metacarpals, which are the middle pads, and then a heel pad. And those three different types of pads are variously expressed in different animals. We'll go through a movement chart where we'll look at the different terms used. And um, I actually took those terms from four of the most common field guides. And we'll, we'll, they, there has a little bit of interchangeability with some of those terms, like whether it's a lope or a gallop or a bound, there's a little bit of overlap, but we'll, we'll break that down. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the scat or spore or feces as it were that are left behind by these animals. So again, track morphology using the opossum, which um, I was saying to Nora and Lori before, a friend of mine called me up tonight and had an opossum in his chicken house. And he said, what should I do? And I said, well, see if you can trap it and move it if you're afraid of having your chickens eaten. He says, okay. So we went called back. He the opossum did not play dead, but it was pretty docile, went into his live trap and he called me back. He says, now what do I do? <laughs> I don't want to kill. I want to release it someplace. And of course, as many of you know, opossums are, are, you know, they're just making their way up into the North Country with any kind of, you know, serious population expansion. And they're not, they're not present all the time in the central part of the state, but they are year-round residents now in southern New Hampshire and, and so forth. But they have toe pads, which you can see out right on the outline here. Um, and there are five of them that correspond with the five toes. They also have these metacarpal pads, which are better expressed uh, in the hind foot. Uh, and those metacarpals have a lot to do with um, how they are actually using the force of movement to either break or accelerate, right? And then the heel pad, which is not significant in um, an opossum, unlike us and many other mammals where the heel pad is absolutely necessary for balance and for the directional movement as well. So you can, for instance, when you're walking, you know, turn your heel pad one way or the other to help direct your foot. And that's how a lot of our quadrupeds use their heel pads as well. So again, we're we got the toe pads up north there uh, and the metacarpal in the central and down south, we get the heel pads, which again will vary by species. In terms of walking patterns, uh, the most common, which is one that we see in, in virtually all of our mammals is the walk, a simple walking pattern. And that in the case here, looking at a gray fox is a what they call a perfect step where the hind foot registers on top of the front foot. So it almost appears like they're pogo sticking their way along through the snow. Um, and that's for a perfect walker like a canine or a feline. And we'll talk a little bit more about who's perfect walkers and, and who is an imperfect walker as it were. Uh, but that's uh, the most common. Uh, and we see again, uh, walking patterns in all of our animals. Although in the, in the more common condition for uh, say squirrels and mice and so forth, they tend to hop. So even though all of them can walk and it's important to recognize that we, we will come across and talk about the more common, common patterns. So on the left, you've got the slow movement and that's column A and on M on the right, you've got the faster movement patterns. And as you can see, I've got four of the field guide, um, authors and what they call each of these movement pattern types, right? So with walking starting on the left and then going into say a trot or a slow, a fast walk or a slow trot, whatever, uh, to a trot and then a lope as you start to expand uh, your, your feet registry apart, 
uh, as you work towards the fastest movement on column I is a gallop. And then uh, somewhat separate from the gallop, uh, which is more common for these types of, from A to I, you have slow and faster movements among the bounders or leapers, right? So you've got on J, K, L, and M, uh, are bounders or hoppers if you're half penny uh, or leapers if you're Murray. And, and in that case, you can see how you've got some different patterns. And we'll go through a couple of these as we come across our, across our species. In the fast lope or gallop, you have either a transverse movement or a rotary movement. This pattern here of a gray fox is rotary, which simply means that it hits with right front, the right front foot, foot first, and then the left front. And then it follows with the left hind and the right hind. And so if you look at it uh, in, in that way, you can see that it's more or less a clockwise rotational gallop instead of what they call a transverse or counterclockwise rotational gallop. Our ungulates are the most expressive when it comes to galloping and uh, various species have preferentially rotary gallops or transverse gallops. And we'll take a look at an illustration of that in a minute. But first to review what animals generally do, as I said, pretty much everybody walks. These are our common um, mammals for our region here in the Northeast. Pretty much everybody walks and the X means that that's the most common pattern they use. Uh, and in some cases, um, a crawl walk might be you know, equally, uh, equally used. And then you have a dash for occasional use of different uh, walk, uh, walking, trotting, galloping, or jumping patterns. And you can see with our small mammals, which are the ones on the left here, uh, <clears throat> smaller, I should say, because um, cottontails aren't exactly real small, but the smaller ones tend to be in the jumping or leaping group, right? Whereas our predators, uh, especially our canines and our, our felines, are definitely in the uh, walking or trot, fast trot, slow lope group. Um, <clears throat> I should put in that uh, our, our foxes, which are, you know, <laughs> how can I say foxtrot? Yeah. I, Anybody foxtrot out there? Yeah, I, okay. Uh, so that is another common movement, but it's more of a fast walk that they're actually doing. That's the most common and the most efficient means of locomotion across the landscape as these predators uh, are out uh, hunting for, for prey. Um, so with that, a little bit of background, we'll get into some of the species um, and Yes, the answer to your question, whether that was in New Hampshire, um, the answer is no. And you botanists out there can see sagebrush here on the left. So you know this is not a New England site, but it could be. Um, even though as much as we're losing our moose to winter tick and brain worm, uh, every so often an albino will be thrown off. I had to show you that picture. This is my, one of my favorites. So moose. Moose is our largest ungulate. And as most of you know, ungulates have their two middle toes having evolved to being the primary uh, ground contact, uh, means of ground contact, all right? So you're walking on two paired toes, whereas the uh, outer two toes have uh, evolved to getting up higher on the hoof and actually not really registering unless you're in soft snow, mud, etc. Moose, as you know, um, are, well, they're, they're an iconic species for those of us in the North Woods. And um, as many of you all also know, uh, moose are uh, in pretty significant decline. Uh, fishing game with uh, help from some contractors, uh, documented a 40, I think it was a 42% uh, 
uh, decline in surviving offspring after the second year on the basis of winter tick. Um, and this has been something that's been getting worse and worse as climate change brings us warmer winters, less snow, and a proliferation of ticks. Um, that being said, these, this mama and calf that I photographed in, in Flat Mountain Pond several years ago had no evidence of being so-called the ghost moose, uh, which you no doubt have heard about, moose that are, 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 have lost a lot of their fur due to the winter tick. Um, I won't go into the details of that. It's, a, it's kind of a sorry tale, but I'm sure you can find more information out online on, on that. But moose uh, have this very distinctive, unmistakable, can ta track them year round. Uh, and, and just in case you didn't recognize their, their scapula, that's what sometimes you'll find bones that uh, the coyotes or, or uh, other critters or the small mammals don't eat as quickly. And that would include that. Um, scapula and, and uh, sometimes some of the leg bones. All right, so moving on to the next ungulate, um, white-tailed deer. I think hardly anything needs to be said about these guys. Um, in terms of management, there was a great deal of effort in the 1970s um, at a time at which our deer herd was somewhat depressed to encourage uh, management for deer which would include things like keeping open water available in your backwoods so that they had some fresh water to drink, which they require every day, um, having ample amounts of brushy, uh, low growth in your forest edges to provide the, um, in this case, a pregnant female with food, um, and then providing them with opportunities to refuge and typically conifer stands in the wintertime, which based on work by um, uh, Scott Black and some other folks that have looked at <clears throat> um, what, in, what uh, stimulates the yarding behavior in deer. Um, and that's basically snow that's three quarters the length of their foreleg or roughly 16 inches for our average adult female deer. Now we're, Getting to that, I don't know about you, but in some places where I live, um, we've got 16 inches and by tomorrow we should have that. So if, if the sort of behaviors have stuck and they tend to, then deer will be moving into their winter yards. And that's uh, something that you don't want to say, run some snowmobile trails through if you can at all help it uh, to provide predators with an easier access to these yarding deer. Um, yarding behavior has really gotten a lot less common than it has been in the past. Um, Mike Nelson, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist who tracked deer for many, many years in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Minnesota, found that yarding behavior is actually genetically um, encoded. And he did some, ran some experiments where fawns were separated from their parents before the winter and separated them by, them by upwards of 100 miles and the fawns would find the natal yard in the first winter. And if you think about, it's sort of, you know, okay, the, the miracle of migration in birds is one thing, but in mammals uh, to be able to do that it was pretty remarkable. So here again, there's a strong uh, genetic and of course environmental and learned uh, predilection for deer to go to their yards when the winter snows are deep. So a couple of tidbits about, about uh, deer. You can see that deer have um, a typically alternating walking pattern somewhat wide because their uh, hips are fairly wide relative to other uh, quadrupeds. And when they're running, they spread those two inner toes out to gain traction and to increase the resistance over the ground. Black bear. So besides finding claw marks on beach, um, finding tracks in the woods is always exciting, whether it's um, along the river shore and the Saco, or whether it's in your backyard and you're wondering what's sort of, you know, coming down to your uh, odiferous trash bin. <laughs> um, that's, uh, it's always exciting to see bear. I'd rather not see bear tracks in February like this central lower picture is, uh, but 
um, starting in 2009, I think it was my first year ever seeing bear track in February. And now uh, as of about five years ago, I've seen it every winter. Um, bears should be sleeping in February. That's part of the deal. You build up body fat by eating protein and oil rich foods like acorns and beech nuts in the fall. And that's hence the reason for them climbing beech trees to gain those fatty protein resources. But you don't wanna burn them off. Um, yeah, February's you want to be sleeping. And especially if you're a female and you're thinking about having some young, or I should say you're impregnated and you're, you're going to be giving birth, you want to minimize that energy reserve as much as possible. So we'll see how it goes. But, um, you know, today was, I think it just about hit 40 degrees and we're in February. So if any of you have seen some uh, bear tracks um, out uh, this month, please text me and confirm my one of my many fears about our mammals in winter. But bear are, are fantastic uh, critters and they have, they're very curious. And of course they've got patterns in, of behavior that um, something like this might, might help show off. Now this is April, a bunch of years ago. And this female is um, a little over two years old um, and I knew the, knew the sow mother as it were from being in the neighborhood. And she had learned at an early age that in front of our house, we had bird feeders. <laughs> so this is the sort of first foray out. You can see she's just still waking up and kind of moseying over just to see if that bird feeder is still active. And of course, um, having had some experience with bears pulling over the feeder, um, I went to platform feeders, which they could pull over as many times as they want and not break them. <laughs> and so there was really nothing for this bear other than some, some old seed scent that it's tracking. And there you go. So a reminder to um, you know, bring in your feeders if uh, they are um, susceptible to being pulled down uh, starting, most people say April, but it depends on March and how warm it is. Okay, so our mini bear, which gets a little bit more into the sort of imperfect tracking uh, pattern that we see is a raccoon. And raccoons are not unlike bear and having five toes, front and hind. They have kind of a you know, pigeon toe aspect to their walk, as you can see both in this illustration and in the track set. Um, and they're imperfect walkers in the way that their bodies are large enough and their hips are wide enough that they can't single track. It's very difficult for them to do that. And the only time that they more or less put in a single sort of collection of tracks is when they're hopping through deep snow. But otherwise, a walking pattern, as you see here, has an opposition effect. This middle one, sort of a, a little bit of a faster walk, slow lope. And this one at the bottom with the rule shows an average walking pattern where, where the hind foot and the front foot are exactly opposite each other. So instead of tracking in a single track, they have to walk with their feet apart as they track over where they've been. That is to say, each of the hind feet's tracking into the front foot in front of it. So it's more of a pace, a slower moving pattern, which is typical for an animal that can climb trees. Hence bear, raccoon, what I called the mini bear. The scat is blocky uh, and cylindrical roughly three quarters of an inch in diameter, sometimes as little as a half inch if it's a young individual, and typically deposited at the base of their uh, roosting tree or den tree as the case may be. Um, as we get into the mustelid group or um, weasel family as it's called, uh, we're looking at 
um, a number of different species. We'll start with the smallest one that's very common, and that's ermine. Uh, when a, you look at the size of an ermine, you, if you can see this, the middle tracks here are ermine and the ones crossing it are as a squirrel, just to give you a little bit of size reference. In deep snow, it appears like there's this long sort of tubular uh, track pattern going forward. They do well climbing trees. This one I caught on camera having just taken a, a, a hairy tailed mole in its mouth. And um, this one's a National Fish and our Feder Wildlife Federation stock photo. Two by twos, right? So two by two. This show was a little bit of an offset on this particular weasel. Uh, this is a generalized weasel pattern, but in the field for ermine, you're gonna see a two by two pattern. Hope we'll see, hopefully we'll see that on Saturday, at least uh, if not this species, then it's in its larger cousin, the long tail weasel. So here again, two by two, it's a bounding pattern. So two hind feet landing, two uh, front feet landing and two hind feet placed in the same location on a diagonal. And that's very typical. When you get really far apart, it might be a little, for a fast bound, it might be a little difficult to see the, the diagonal pattern. It might almost look like they're right next to each other. Uh, but generally speaking, as to say, the male, which tends to be larger by as much as 50% in the mustelid female of the next largest species, right? So a large ermine is going to have a track set that is almost identical to a female long-tailed weasel. And a male long-tailed weasel will have a size track very similar to a mink, uh, which is again, the next size up. The difference primarily is the fact that mink are notorious for waterways. This is, as you can see, some thin ice or thin snow over ice. Um, and their, their location of where they are really, you know, sort of gives it away. But I've seen plenty of long tail weasels in mink habitat and vice versa. So it's not an exact science. Um, the only other thing I'll say about mink, um, this is a, a typical mink scat, which is uh, just, just to refresh, is quite a bit larger than a long-tailed uh, weasel uh, scat, uh, is that mink um, will also run in a three-by pattern, so-called. It almost it appears that um, you have two front feet registering just a little behind the hind foot. And so it almost looks like a one, two, one, or what some people call a three by pattern. Looks like there are three tracks being made. And that's because the mink body is a little bit chunkier than the ermine and long tail. And so in moving through deep snow, it's a little harder for it to get distance. And so it makes a slightly different track pattern. This is a typical two by two, but I should show you a three by three at some point here. Um, the next size up, which does overlap with the mink is the pine marten or American marten. And, you know, were we in Tin Mountain, I'd ask, ask for a hint <laughs> how many people have seen Joe Kelly's now, or formerly Jillian Kilborn, Joe Kelly's um, uh, pro program on, on Pine Martins, it was fantastic. She's, she's really the, the state's um, foremost authority on Pine Martins and regularly traps them. And thanks to her with this um, uh, camera trap that she set up in the North Country to document the movements and, and patterns of Pine Martin, she caught one with a fisher. <laughs> Well, it almost looks like it, but that's been, that was actually a spliced shot, she told us afterwards. But a fisher and a pine marten, to give you a sense of the difference in size. Again, we're building up in size in our weasel family, and the pine marten is next after mink, and the next size up, of course, is fisher. But look at the pine marten track detail here by the compass. 
you'll see that in fact, there's very little detail to be seen. They have so much fur around their toes, it's difficult to see any metacarpal, if not any heel pads as well. Toe pads you can see, but it's otherwise difficult to see toe uh, uh, pad registry in the snow because of the amount of hair that they have, which again is an indicator of their you know, obligate sort of deep snow type habitats that they inhabit. But a two by two pattern, just like a typical weasel, just a little bit larger than the mink. What you, when you get into Fisher, uh, yeah, now you're into uh, our largest upland weasel that we have. Um, and here on the right is the one two one pattern I was mentioning before about the mink, where the front feet again are placed here. This is the direction is going down screen. So the front feet are the upper ones and the hind feet are the lower ones. You can see that that left front and the right hind are very close to one another. So it almost looks like there are three tracks. That's what I mean by a three by pattern. And this one too, you can see a little bit of that three by pattern for Fisher. And here again, not unlike mink, uh, Fisher are tree climbers and have a shorter, thicker body than the narrow, long weasel um, body, right? Uh, I should say long tail and, and short tail or ermine. And as a consequence, they don't separate their tracks as much as you see with uh, either of those smallest of our mustelids. Typical uh, Fisher scat um, here in the center, um, and it varies. It, it really does vary quite a bit. Um, I know this is, may gross a few of you out, but the best way to tell if it's a mink or a Fisher is to smell it. Um, you want to do that cautiously, but and, and don't do what I say. <laughs> but truth be told, mink are characteristically fishy in odor, indicating their aquatic habitat, whereas uh, fishers have a, a not, not so much of a fishy, fishy odor to it. And then uh, uh, similar, but also um, uh, slightly different used to be in the weasel family, but now in its own family, Mephitidae, uh, is the striped skunk. And again, not unlike bear, we should not be seeing these two very often in the deep, deepest part of winter, the coldest part of winter. And I, mine, uh, my neighborhood skunks have, have been sleeping now for a little while. Um, but you can see with skunk, based on their very short legs, they can extend very far through the snow. So their tracks are gonna be very close. And as my uh, an old time tracker friend of mine, John Coolish used to say, they look like notes on a scale. You think about a, a musical scale, they almost look like notes across the page. Very elliptic, very uniform. In good registry, you can see five toes front and back with long toenails stretching out from the toe pads. Okay, so that's again, a distinct adaptation that skunk has to its environment and being able to optimize its food sources, which are largely um, gained by, by digging in the soil. And then last but not least in the mustelidae is the otter. And that is our largest mustelid, uh, but in terms of uh, habitat, it's really a riparian one and not an upland species per se. This picture on the lower left was taken at Tin Mountain. It was at an, in an old beaver lodge many years ago, uh, and the otter uh, was occupying that lodge. And one of the cool things about otter, aside from just having a whole lot of fun sliding down the snow, and if you've ever seen that or watched it, <laughs> it definitely looks like they're having a good time because they will go back up the hill and slide down again just for the hell of it. Um, otters will cohabit with beavers uh, in their dens in the wintertime, uh, in their lodges, I should say. And you can actually have a beaver, an otter, and sometimes a muskrat in the same lodge in the wintertime, which is kind of unusual because uh, otherwise you'd be seeing in the summertime uh, otters just as soon going after the baby beavers to eat them. So, uh, but it's one of those things that mammals do, quadrupeds do in the winter to sort of break out of their routine and, and help help in their survival. Okay, moving into the canines, uh, we have 
well, if you can find the fox, yeah, this is <laughs> a, a photograph somebody sent to me called Deep Trouble. Um, fox have the typical um, four toe pad arrangement in front and hind. And as um, has been said by many um, folks who are, are excellent trackers, uh, I think Su Susan Morris was the first person that talked to me about this about 20 years ago, is that they have an X pattern, right? You can take a line and cross between the inner and outer toe and, and run a line in front of the heel pad and make an X. And that's canine, right? That's canid. And that's, you'll see in a minute, very different than feline or cat. And here you see the same thing. It's not as well expressed, but there's an X pattern with these four toes and a lobed heel pad that is somewhat pointed, okay? Somewhat pointed. And keep that in mind when we go to the cat page to compare. Um, Red Fox has just a, a, another tidbit has been subject to canine distemper over the last 10 years or so to a significant degree uh, and combined with trapping pressure uh, and road mortality uh, from some occasional rabies outbreaks, uh, our red fox numbers are way down. Uh, it's, it, this is, I think in the last five years, gray fox in, in, in my neighborhood is as common, if not more common than red fox. And that's, that's never been the case. Uh, for, for 30 years of tracking in Southern New Hampshire, I think if I saw one gray fox to every um, you know, five or six red fox, that'd be about average. Now they're equal in their population size. And in my neighborhood, gray fox is actually outnumbering reds on account of that loss of the red fox population. So we have a little bit of an issue there. And if you've been wondering why you have so dang many mice in your basement or in your attic, there is one of your reasons right there. We've lost one of our best mousers in the, in the neighborhood in terms of red fox populations. Gray fox, a little smaller, whereas red fox has a track that is somewhat um, you know, similar in shape. Uh, it's ellipsoid and roughly an inch and a half long by about an inch and a quarter wide. And we'll go over those numbers if any of you are on the Saturday walk and, and we, we come across these patterns. Uh, whereas gray fox has about an inch, an, an eighth to an inch and a quarter length to about an inch wide, sometimes an inch and an inch and an eighth wide as well. And if you look at the two tracks here, you'll note a couple of different things. One, the hind foot is more ellipsoid than the front foot, which is the lower one of this lower right picture. The front foot is wider. And they call this the cat-like canine because it has toes that are somewhat adept at climbing trees. They have fairly long claws, which you can almost see on the picture here of this great <laughs> individual uh, taken by David Downs. And as a consequence, if you find a, a cat-like canine track, you definitely got you know, the, the cross pattern where you get an X that you can do, whoops. Uh, you can see that X. Um, it's gonna likely be a gray fox. Their legs are not that long. They're about eight to 10 inches long. And as a consequence in snow, like we have out there now, they're gonna be dragging those legs through the snow and they won't nearly have the ability to perfect step as they do here uh, in shallow depths of snow. So we did a pretty good job, us hominids, in eliminating our top keystone predator in the Northeast. Or I should say both of them. Uh, we got rid of the mountain lion uh, about the same time as we got rid of wolves. And that just left, left a huge ecological niche open for a predator. And it didn't take but about 40 years before we gained this uh, hybrid canine we call now the Eastern Coyote or Coyote, uh, Canis latrans VAR period, meaning that it is a variety that is a result of some cross genetics, mostly Western Coyote and um, Eastern Timberwolf, but also throw in a little bit of dog as we found out when they sampled 
the DNA of some Algonquin provincial park coyotes that showed a little bit of domestic dog. Uh, not probably a common thing, because as you can see with these canines and the attitudes that some of our Eastern coyotes have, um, they more they they would just as soon eat your dog as mate with it, <laughs> and not to say that that's something to fear. This snarling behavior was at uh, my compost pit, and there was a female that was contending for the same food, and that was the dominant male baring his teeth, which was very silent and doing so as a way of just saying, "Hey, this is my food." stay away until I'm done. And that type of alpha behavior is essential in a packing animal like Eastern Coyote, not unlike it was or is, I should say, for the Eastern Timber Wolf. The survival of the species is dependent upon a social structure that's very defined. And if you don't have these cues that can train in the young of the year, then they don't learn the ways to A, avoid people, B, socialize with other canines in their greater family group and 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 see um, be able to reproduce in a successful way. Um, people talk about packs of coyotes and uh, I, I encourage you to uh, take one of Chris Shadler's coyote talks. You can learn a lot more about coyotes than I can possibly talk about today, but believe you me, um, uh, she and I both can go on for well over two hours talking just about this incredible species that is one of the most successful adaptation stories in the Northeast. Um, so there you have it. And Northeast, heck, it's uh, there in Florida and everywhere in between. Okay, getting into the, the felines, we have um, just check time check. We got a few minutes left. That should end up pretty well. Um, we've got the bobcat, which is now, uh, they estimate, uh, well, they had an estimate of about 1,500 individuals in the state, and I'd say we could probably double that at this point. Bobcats have, have come back tremendously, and as this one uh, uh, photographed by Peg Ridgely, which is right behind her bird feeder, <laughs> can tell you and when you have a hole in the pr prey base in terms of predators, like not as many fox, no more wolves, et cetera, then you have these meso predators that are filling the space. And bobcats are doing a great job. Um, they have a slight offset to their pattern. They're walkers. Notice how they're, they step side to side a little. And that's because their shoulders are wide enough for them to climb trees and of course um, claw on them like cats do to sharpen their claws. It just must feel good. And as a consequence, it, you can distinguish in deep snow very quickly, whether it's a canine or a feline by the width of what they call the straddle. And again, we'll talk more about that in the summertime, uh, excuse me, in Saturday. When we talked uh, uh, about you know, habitats and the use of habitats, bobcats like these uh, den environments, as you see here in the castle, uh, which is where I took this this picture of evidence of uh, breeding bobcats and took some more pictures of bobcat dens that I've come across over the years. Um, they have begun to move away from these ledgy talus areas for their reproductive needs. And as a consequence, they've adapted well to different environments, including underneath old barns and whatnot to breed. So, but not natally, they, you know, originally they, they were confined to these rocky talus slopes for breeding. Lynx, I mentioned uh, Mark Elbrock, who uh, worked for Fish and Game and was the first uh, Interstate 89 in Hopkinton. Um, and it's a northern species that's dependent upon snowshoe hair for its prey base and deep snow as a consequence to, to be able to optimize uh, a snowshoe hair using these really wide, wide feet. I mean, these are like three and a half to four inches wide on an animal that weighs less than a bobcat, right? 
most people think, oh, links are bigger than bobcat. Uh -uh. No, they're like, you know, 12 to 15 pounds. Bobcats, and, and that's average on the sort of, you know, across the sexes. Bobcats will go from 15 to 25 pounds. There's even been, you know, they've even been trapped in at 30 pounds for big males. So bobcats are chunkier and weightier, but lynx have the larger feet. Uh, I took one track uh, picture here in the Ospies and then a remote part that uh, was feline and the size of a lynx. I have no, no knowledge as to whether that was a lynx, but I did report it. It's not impossible to have lynx coming down as their population has begun to increase in certainly into southern the southern parts of Coas County. We know they're in the northern part. Uh, this track that Mark took was in Jefferson uh, and Randolph and um, you know, it, it, we, we should expect them now into the central and southern parts of the White Mountains if their population continues to increase. As well as none other but <laughs> the Eastern Coup. Why, I could not, you know, do this without showing you some tracks. No, this was not taken in New Hampshire, but this picture was. And this picture was um, of some bone scat that I sent off for DNA analysis, which came back uh, as no significant difference between the Eastern mountain lions that they had scat DNA from in the Midwest, which is where the nearest natal uh, mountain lion or cougar um, uh, habitat or breeding area is. You all know about the Connecticut cat that traveled 1200 miles east from North Dakota or South Dakota rather. Yeah, this is, um, this is sort of the same, same deal. Um, this animal is present. I'm sure if I, you know, people raised hands and you can do this in the chat if you want, if you've seen cougars. Um, every year I get reports of them. I stop tallying them. Um, there's just a few of us that have tallied uh, cougar sightings and followed up with people on this in the North County. It hands down, they are here as dispersers. Uh, they're not coming. There's no residential population yet. There likely won't be because cars and guns will probably do them in far faster than they can possibly populate. Keeping in mind that this, this picture was taken at the Science Center. Um, um, and this, you know, these guys are now, geez, I guess they're about 15 years old, 16 years old. They've been there for some time. Uh, but um, these cats are, are wide ranging individuals. They eat you know, large game, primarily ungulates, and we have plenty of deer here and we have good habitat that could support them. We just don't have a cooperative public to allow them to um, reside. And I doubt that is going to take, take place. All right, we're getting to one of our last animals, snowshoe hare. Um, I'm gonna, skip on some of the smaller rodents uh, today, but I wanted to make sure you had uh, some info on snowshoe hare, uh, which uh, as a primary prey species, normally we're looking at a camouflaged individual like you see in the middle picture here. But as many of you know, our snowless winters are bringing about this slight anomaly of having snowshoe hare being white against a brown background. And um, whereas our long tail weasels have adapted somewhat to changing snow conditions and they are brown year round in Connecticut and white up here, we haven't yet seen that color dimorphism shift uh, in response to um, longer later falls and, and later winter snows. Uh, but we probably will is my, my bet. Um, they're hoppers, leapers with gigantic hind feet that's three and a half to four inches long uh, that can tolerate deep snows very easily and, and make some very quick work of crossing those snows, especially when being chased or running from predators. Little round scats, they're coprophagous. They'll eat their own scat three or four times to regain whatever nutrients are left. And if you're lucky, in another couple of weeks or so, you'll see, see some estrus blood in their urine marks indicating that they're coming into season as many of our quadrupeds are. So that's, um, that's about, I think that's 
Oh, wow. Well, okay. Porcupine. I, I, I'll have to throw in one rodent anyway to, to, to satisfy. I'll do this one as our, as our last one. Um, porcupine. Here again, uh, porkies are just iconic in our landscape. Um, there are effective New England sloths. And when you see them lollygagging around on the trees in the summertime, they kind of have that sort of presence of, of being slow. And, you know, with quills like that, what's to fear? Well, okay, so maybe Fisher but, and Bobcat, but um, really they do have done very well. And in fact, in the absence of Fisher, which is another species we've lost to uh, trapping pressure and canine distemper, um, we've got a lot more porcupines out there in the landscape than we've, we've had in the last three decades. It's quite a number of them. And they will have an impact, as you see with this hemlock. They'll actually bonsai these trees that they're feeding on and you know, stunt their growth. And if you have active porcupine dens like you had, like, like we had near this tree that I, where I took this picture, this feeding goes on year after year after year. And this tree, which is like 12 inches in diameter, was only 25 feet tall. You know, and that's a, a sign of a persistent and successful porcupine den. Uh, they are uh, slow walkers. They're wide. Of course, they're climbing trees. So they have wide hips, and so their feet are widely apart. And they'll repeat their patterns back and forth, back and forth from a feeding area to their overnight denning area, which is usually one or two or three places during the winter. Sometimes it's only one place. But in any case, these rapid or repeated patterns across the snow uh, is a sure sign that you've got porcupine. Uh, in tow. So, all right, well, we've gone uh, just about an hour and I'm going to uh, stop sharing the screen and check in with uh, Nora and the chat box. And if anybody's got a Q&A, this is the time when we can, we can get at that. Yes, Rick, thank you so much. Actually, before <laughs> to stop sharing, or I guess you could look at the pic image yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a question regarding the link slide um, and okay. web photo was um, whether an image was a double exposure or whether there were two links pictured. So uh, is that in, well, obviously the two links here, uh, what's the track picture right here? Or which one was I don't, it? Yeah, I don't know. It might, be, it might be the uh, kit, the. Um, These guys? Are they kittens? Is that what? Yeah, they're, they're kittens. They're little lynx babies. You see the blue, blue mm -hmm. uh, pupils. Yeah, these are little babies. The two of them. Pretty cute. Don't want to take them home for a pet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we've had, um, there was some pictures that were floating around the YouTube. You can, you know, Google that or whatever, of, of four kittens on uh, one female up in Maine last, I think it was last year. Um, I, I think that's the most, normally it's a two, two kitten litter, sometimes three, but four. So there, which is a good sign. Um, you know, Arusta County has had a, never really lost their population of lynx and um, having them back in co-ops, I think is a, is a great thing. They are federally threatened as many of you know, um, and for those of us that do wildlife habitat assessments for uh, various agencies, um, including forest, the Forest Service, we have to document habitat for them. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Rick. Um, I had a question for you, because um, inevitably, whether it's um, you know with the general public or um, with, you know, with school groups, when you're out tracking, it is, there seem to be a couple tracks that easily sort of, you know, are one thing and are easily dupe people into believing they are something else. Um, and so I didn't know if you could sort of speak to what some of the more, like the most common misidentified tracks yeah. are. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And hands down in my book is coyote and deer. And you would think that, yeah, they're different, but <laughs> add some deep snow, soft snow, 
where there's no track registry. And unless you're reaching down into that snow, which I will do on Saturday to demonstrate and feeling for those that cloven hoof. And on top of that, keep in mind that deer are obviously in the winter time, an especially tasty morsel for the coyote if they can keep up with them. And so what coyotes will do is actually put their paws in the deer track after the deer has gone by and follow them that way. And it tells them a lot of things. Not only is it you know, obvious for them they can follow the deer, but by walking the deer path, they get a sense of how old, weak, sick, enabled those deer are, right? And I didn't show you this picture. I should probably, this is, I, I've got to show you this, but this is, this is worth bringing in. Let me just scroll through here because this is pretty classic. It gets at, you know, different ways you can track animals and how to do so. And these are all the rodents and so forth. But um, in wildlife tracking, you know, ways of documenting mammal sign, wildlife photography and wildlife cams have really changed that whole thing around. And when you look at a picture like this, <laughs> talk about deep trouble. This was taken out west, but it is a pattern that is common for many predators. And for those of you who can't see that, um, this is a mule deer being tracked less than 10 feet away by a mountain lion. And what that mountain lion is doing is gauging the health of that mule deer, right? And if there is a sense that this deer is compromised in any way, the mountain lion, which is, you know, trying to place its bets on whether it can capture this deer on a, on a short burst of speed, is detecting that. And the coyotes do the same thing with the animals that they track. So that would be one sort of easily mistaken set of tracks that you could come across. Another, which I think in finer snow, this shallower, better tracking snow, is red fox and young coyotes, which can look very similar and be less than a half inch in, in difference in terms of size of the track. Um, and that's, that can be another confusing one. Um, perhaps most people confuse red and gray squirrels, uh, especially if it's soft snow, because the reds look like they're huge and they're really not. So there's a little bit of that, but good question. Thank you. All right. And there was one question, there was a question that came in sort of following up with the, the mountain lions as to whether there are any known pairs in the state or if yeah. they're sort of entirely transitory. Not, not that I know or that I've ever heard of. I've never, in all the dozens and dozens of site records that I've heard from people, um, including some Tin Mountain staffers who took a picture, uh, it's always been an individual animal, never a pair. Um, and, you know, one of the questions I often get is, well, how do you know they're not residential? And it's pretty simple. If you've been in mountain lion country and you know what their pattern of behavior is in territory, <laughs> it is very different. You're going to see claw marks. You're going to see scent marks. You're going to see scat placed repeatedly in one location. You're also going to see cached animals like deer hauled up into a tree, which we've seen. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the cougars are not caching their animals as single individuals, but you'd see a lot more of that. And we've only seen a couple of instances in New Hampshire where deer carcasses, in one case, a sheep carcass was hauled up into a tree. And that's definitively a cougar behavior. So as far as I know, Tom, no, we don't have any pairs and certainly no residential animals. Um, so I have a question for you following up on the um, on right. lion and uh, you know with all the uh, you know, controversy in seeing those. Um, have there been any instances of wolf 
tracks showing up in the state. I know years ago we had um, someone present on sort of the all the barriers of what it would take um, of wolves crossing over from Canada, but have there been any instances of wolves being tracked in the state? Well, you know, it, <laughs> it's, I've had that question posed a lot. And, and, you know, the answer I typically give is yes, um, we've had plenty of evidence of wolves. It's just that the animals that we see are only part wolf. And that is the Eastern coyote, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, many of you might know Katie Thompson and the other store in Tamworth, but she's got a picture on her wall of the store that is, it's either a wolf or the biggest Eastern coyote I've ever seen in New Hampshire. And, you know, we've got um, individuals, uh, coyotes that have pushed the scales at 60 pounds. And when my wife did wolf biology work in Minnesota and we lived out there, um, 60 pounds was the average size of a female wolf at Eastern uh, gray wolf. So, you know, it's, it's not like we're very far away from having wolves. That being said, if you look at the genetic strain of a pure wolf, yeah, we've had two records in Maine, Northern Maine, both were from uh, individuals that were shot, as you can imagine, uh, it, you know, most large canines that are wild get dispatched pretty quickly. And so I think that's the primary reason we haven't had more reports of what might be called a, a you know, a disperser from Algonquin Provincial Park, which is the nearest known sort mm -hmm. of wolf location. And even there, they're very, very scarce. Um, you really have to go farther west to get um, Eastern timber wolves you know, in the wild. And of course, there, you, you don't have to go that far because the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, uh, of course, we had the Wolves of Iowa Royale, it's pretty famous. And then the Gunflint area of Northeastern Minnesota uh, have good re residential populations still. So, great question. All right, thank you. Um, so if anyone else has any questions for Rick, um, tracking questions you can um you can go ahead and unmute yourself um and as i also said if uh if this has whetted your appetite and you're um uh, interested in joining us on saturday morning for some very what will likely be some very fresh track very fresh <laughs> after <laughs> after the snow um there are a few spots still still left in that and there's a registration link right on our our website too org but um i don't know if there are any any other questions i know rick has thrown lots of information at us i know try and limit it a little bit you know of course that i could go on for another yes. hour at least <laughs> <laughs> but we'll save it for saturday so thanks everybody for all right perfect being yes. here. thank, thank you. you Nora. thank it's you rick great. and we will I'll see you tomorrow morning. Yeah, see you tomorrow morning. Enjoy the snow, everybody. All right. Thanks.